3D printing can do a lot. Doctors 3D print customized implants and even medication with individual dosage needs. Rapid prototyping has relied on 3D printing for a decade now. There's this themed restaurant in London where everything from chairs through cutlery and even food is printed from scratch. And recently hobbies and enthusiasts held a national competition for 3D printed guns in the United States. Because of course the United States. First, startups are popping up with promising technology to print affordable housing faster, cheaper, and more sustainably. 3D printing is promising and uh, oddly satisfying. Um, as far as promises go, we've been burned by past innovations promising us decentralization and economic liberation. The internet was supposed to be this new tool for the little guy to take on the global corporate world. And um, look where we are now. Deb, do you want to take us through some of the exciting games in the pipeline for Quest? Absolutely. So, yeah. What I am interested in is what this technology can actually do for our economy, for everyday person and not global conglomerates. Can you 3D print parts to repair your own car or phone instead of buying overpriced proprietary replacements? Can you skip the queue on the supply chain backlogs and just get the stuff made locally instead of delivered to you from across the planet? Can we finally get customized products instead of one-size-suits-all mass-scale manufacturing? And also, can we change our production so that it is less wasteful and more sustainable in our struggle against the climate change? Some sell 3D printing tech as the answer to all of our problems, especially when combined with automation and artificial intelligence. But I am skeptical. The internet today is controlled by the top 5 or 6 media and tech companies, and instead of economic liberation and free flow of information, it gives us mass surveillance and algorithmic censorship. In the shadow of all this theater, there is one major threat to 3D printing, and if we don't eliminate it, we might never reach the full potential of 3D printing economy. This one thread is the reason we are only now considering the future of 3D printing when we could have had it all 30 years ago. What is 3D printing? Well, I know everyone watching this already has a pretty good idea. You have a machine that squirts an ink that cools down, solidifies, and maintains a three-dimensional structure. It prints from a file of a 3D model just like printing a picture on a piece of paper. The engineering industry officially calls this process additive manufacturing. You build objects by adding layers of raw material on top of each other following a 3D design of a model. This term, additive manufacturing, is used as a direct opposite to the traditional manufacturing, which until recently was just called manufacturing. Oh my god! But now it's referred to as subtractive manufacturing. Instead of adding layers of material from scratch, you remove parts of material until you have the desired size, shape, and volume. In traditional manufacturing, you need a lot of material to make a small amount of product. The rest is waste. In additive manufacturing, you get the roughly same amount of final product as the amount of material you started with. I know, I know, molds exist, but we'll get to the problems of that later. Stick with me, okay? For example, to build a house the traditional way, you need to cut a lot of lumber and bricks to fit the design and structural limitations. And all of those cut-off parts of the building material will never get used again, and we'll end up in a landfill. But you can 3D print the same house in your desired shape, respecting all the limitations you encounter without producing almost any waste. 3D printing isn't inherently going to make production cheaper or faster, but it doesn't have to in order for 3D printing to take off. The appeal of using less resources is incredibly strong on its own, for environmental and economical reasons, but also in times of one of the worst shortage crises in history. The prices of everything are skyrocketing. Lumber, semiconductors, food, gas, electricity, and even labor are in massive shortage. Too many slaves died of COVID. 
Backlogs are creating bottlenecks for the global logistics, and just-in-time delivery is in complete crumbles. When everything works as intended, traditional manufacturing, exploiting cheap offshore labor, can produce at scale of millions of units in just a few weeks or months. The economies of scale is bringing marginal cost of each product down to the fraction of what it would cost local producers to make them from scratch. Global corporations with transnational reach were dependent on the system, alongside their ability to snatch natural resources from impoverished nations. But now it's been almost two years since the pandemic, and things aren't looking to get back to normal anytime soon. And it doesn't seem like such a good idea to return to normal, considering the scarcity of resources and environmental impact are only going to worsen under traditional system. And it's questionable whether traditional manufacturing would be so cheap if it weren't outsourcing production to places with exploitative worker practices and downright slave labor. 3D printing economy has the potential to change all that. Production no longer has to be outsourced, but can be initiated locally. This eliminates the over-dependence on global just-in-time delivery. And it gives labor to skilled workers trained to work with software and tools needed for pre- and post-processing. Because it's using computer-assisted design, digital models can be made anywhere in the world and brought straight to production without any backlogs. This dramatically shortens the design-to-market cycle from months or weeks to just a few days or even hours. Where big corporations fail, workers that lost jobs to outsourcing can pick up the slack with their local 3D printing business. Their production can flexibly adapt as the demand fluctuates without causing ripple effects on the rest of the economy. Novelty products that aren't profitable on the large assembly line can be temporarily introduced into 3D printers without affecting the manufacturing cost. Imagine if your car breaks down and some of its parts need immediate replacement, but the nearest shop is out of stock and it would take days or weeks to resupply. A 3D printer could save you a day by printing parts as needed. This is what the US Marine Corps have been doing for several years. If military vehicles break on a mission, repair is 3D printed on demand and delivered to the unit semi-autonomously. The pandemic has proven independent 3D printing businesses to be extremely successful at taking over the shattering global supply chain. Companies turn to 3D printing to locally produce face shields, ventilator valves, or face masks for medical workers within hours when the traditional system will take weeks or even fail to deliver completely. Shortages happen when suppliers run out of stock. But if there is no stock, there is nothing to run out of. That doesn't make sense. Okay, shortages can happen for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes supply routes get blocked, other times whatever is going here happens. This bottleneck of container ships, as far as the eye can see, carries more than half the Made in Asia items purchased by the American consumer. One industry that feels the pain the most, currently, is the chip sector. Manufacturers of semiconductor chips have to keep a lot of parts in bulk supply because they are difficult and costly to produce on demand. But the market volatility since COVID dried out those reserves, creating indefinite shortages of electronic components. But components for silicon chips can be 3D printed too. Manufacturers are already implementing several fabrication techniques that are going to decentralize production of passive components. It might not redesign the whole industry, but it can avoid a lot of congestion points of the global supply line. Every year since 2014, more than a billion units of smartphones is sold to end users. This is only possible with manufacturing at scale, producing uniform products a few millions at a time. It is cost-effective, sure, but it also lacks any creativity and customization. Every phone made in the past few years looks the same with only minor cosmetic tweaks here and there. You're not allowed to have different needs than anyone else who bought the same device as you because it's not profitable to cater to individuals. But what if you could design your own favorite piece of electronic equipment and have it 3D printed on demand? Or just print it yourself at home? And why not have a different form factor? Why not print for IoT devices or make a completely new product? There is a really awesome project that maybe only serves as a proof of concept right now, but nonetheless, that could be an exciting peek into the future. A laptop made of almost completely open source hardware that serves as a platform on which anyone can 3D print their own custom design. 
This project was started as a response to Snowden's NSA leaks that disclosed how companies making proprietary products secretly install backdoor for government mass surveillance. With open source machines like this, it would be easier to spot shady modifications and mass surveillance, in, at least in theory, wouldn't happen. Now granted, security and privacy aren't such pressing issues for most people to suddenly start manufacturing electronics in their own living rooms. However, this is just another example of what 3D printing could easily do when traditional manufacturing would laugh it off as unprofitable. People have different needs, they require different hardware configurations, they might reduce costs by removing less needed parts somewhere and instead invest more into some other, more desired components. 3D printing can offer customization at no additional cost. Why is that? Traditional manufacturing works best in bulk orders and slave labor. They stick to one mold for a time, mass produce at scale, and break the backs of sweatshop workers. But redesigning production to fit individual demands is too expensive. These machines were designed to make one product at a time. Redesigning would slow down the manufacturing process to the point no one would be able to afford custom products at prices that would cover the increase in cost. 3D printing doesn't really have this problem. It can adapt to any redesign at any time and any scale as long as the raw materials are there. Have individual customers with special orders? No problem, let's send the design files to the printing machines and they spit them out in no additional time. Traditional manufacturing has erased customization out of the equation of what people can reasonably expect today. But humans have been manufacturing custom designs since forever. Handmade tools and equipment used to be built to last a lifetime or even be handed down by generations. People were used to having quality products they were able to repair. It's only now that cheap, replaceable, one-size-suits-all products that don't last beyond their legal warranty have completely flooded the market. Planned obsolescence is one of the worst things humanity could have done to this planet, and yet you'd never expect anything to last you longer than a few years at most. But there is a market where, despite all the pressure from the global economy, 3D printing customization flourishes. Healthcare. Healthcare providers struggle to choose between giving more individualized but also more expensive treatment to their patients and opting for a more cost-effective treatment that doesn't cater to individual patient needs. Ideally, we should be able to give every patient the best individual care possible. But on the scale of billions of people, that's just too costly. Too costly under the traditional manufacturing system. But in medicine, 3D printing is taking over. A 54-year-old Spanish patient had a tumor on his ribcage that had to be surgically removed. Unfortunately, doctors had to remove parts of the skeleton to prevent the tumor from spreading. This is where a $1.3 million metal 3D printer came to rescue. Shooting a 3,000-watt electron beam to melt titanium powder at 1,600 degrees Celsius, they reproduced an exact replica of the patient's sternum and ribcage, matching precise CT scans of the biological original. This titanium 3D printer saved the life of a cancer patient by giving them a custom-made ribcage. Everybody is different, and healthcare cannot afford to make compromises to lower marginal costs. Every treatment needs to be individualized. 3D printing has been increasingly used in medicine for over a decade. Whether it's titanium prosthesis, hearing aids, or organ implants, doctors have turned to these machines to save lives, speed up recovery, and improve quality of life. 3D printers have been used to make prosthetic jaws, skull implants, or joint replacements. They've been used to make artificial ears or make windpipe support to help a newborn breathe. In some cases, surgeons create 3D reproductions of affected organs or body parts to plan and practice operation in a safe environment before performing the surgery on a patient. Not so long ago, the FDA approved the first 3D printing drug that is now being prescribed to patients at custom dosage. The drug in question is manufactured so that the pill disintegrates within seconds. The 3D printing of the pill doesn't improve production efficiency. But that's not why the company behind the drug makes it that way. Their only goal was to create a more dissolvable pill, with a porous design that couldn't be achieved with regular press-and-die pill making. The hope is that in the future, drugs could be tailored in their size, dosage, and drug release profile according to doctor's prescriptions. How cool is that?
This is going far beyond what is conventionally available or possible with traditional subtractive manufacturing. And there is something special about additive manufacturing, making only as much as is demanded and never more. The ultimate economic equilibrium, as some would say. Using only as much material as you absolutely need and reducing waste to a minimum. This is an environmental dream. It's almost hard to believe we've had this technology for 40 years and yet none of its dream promises came true. What gives? What gives is that in 1986, the first patent for 3D printing technology was granted to Charles Hole. It was called Apparatus for Production of Three-Dimensional Objects by Stereolithography. Hole then kickstarted the first 3D printing company, 3D Systems Corporation. And then, nothing. A couple of other patents related to 3D printing tech were issued in the following years, but for the next two decades, it was complete silence. Patents, they are a very clever idea. Originally, they were meant to encourage invention and innovation. If you come up with an idea, just talk to the government and they'll make sure no one else will be allowed to profit off of your intellectual property. You will have a 20-year-long monopoly on that idea. This is the threat to 3D printing I hinted at in the beginning. While we allowed few people to profit from an idea that really many others could have come up with and improve upon, the rest of the world could only watch and wait until the patents expire. And when they did, that's when 3D printing finally took off. In 2009, when the patent on fused deposition modeling expired, affordable consumer printers began to proliferate. The story of 3D printing is the clearest example of how patents have the opposite impact as intended. They stifled innovation for two decades, pushing its adoption further into the future. We are missing out. We can't afford to wait 20 years every time a revolutionary invention might give us a chance to do things better. Just imagine what could have been done if the additive manufacturing took off in the 90s, allowing us three decades to push back on climate change and pollution. 3D printers aren't going to replace machines in traditional manufacturing. We don't need to delude ourselves with such hopium. They'll be their excellent companion, that is more realistic bringing the best of the both worlds and eliminating their drawbacks. 3D printers can excel at customization and decentralizing the supply chain, while subtractive manufacturing can mass produce at scale at low cost. We probably shouldn't hope for 3D printing to be able to do more than that, but that might be more than enough. Think about all the implications to intellectual property this will have when everyone could 3D print copyrighted or patented designs and no one could stop them. Open source must go hand in hand with this tech, Otherwise, the only ones who will benefit from it are big corporations and no one else. That's right, motherfuckers, this was just a clickbait to red pill you on open source. Bye. Join us now and share the software. You'll be free, hackers. You'll be free. Join us now and share the software. You'll be free, hackers. You'll